Lauren asked for me to just kind of give you a little idea of where I'm from and what I do. First of all, I'm a child of the King. Amen. And he has called me to be a literature evangelist. Amen. I began when I was very young, uh, going door to door in the first grade, in gathering. Did that for quite a few years. Some of my favorite experiences have been in gathering. Something that I think we should still do as a church. Amen. Because the people in gathering oftentimes receive more of a blessing than the people that give the donations, don't they? Um, I've spent 35 years in the literature ministry, beginning at the age of 18. And most recently, uh, I was working at the College Press for a while, and the Kentucky Tennessee Conference, who I've known for many years, I worked with Elder, Elder Haley when I was in the uh, Georgia Cumberland Conference, where I spent eight years in the literature ministry. And then I spent 11 years in the Southern Union working over the union with the Magabook ministry for the students. But Elder Haley and Doug Hilliard have known me for a long time, and they asked if I would come to the Kentucky Tennessee Conference and infuse the literature ministry as a branch of soul winning. Uh, I've always seen the literature work in that concept, but sometimes as publishing leaders and as co-porters, we can get so busy thinking that we're sowing the seed that we don't spend any time harvesting. And I believe even a good literature evangelist ought to be balanced, and he ought to do some harvesting too. How about you, Inez? Amen. I love Sister Inez. I've known her for quite a while. So I have uh, two grown children, uh, one of them which is still living with me, and I have a daughter in Ohio. My oldest son is my namesake, Rocky G. Jr. He's 27 years old. And then I have an 11-year-old and an 8-year-old. I wish they could be here with me and my wife. Um, she's homeschooling them. So they're back in Georgia right now. Continue to pray because uh, we think our house is sold and we're getting serious about house hunting up here in Tennessee now. And we'll all be together regularly as a family. And I believe that that will only help us to be more effective for the Lord. Before we begin the message, I would like to uh, bow in prayer. You can bow where you are, uh, ever how humbly you may. Our Father in heaven, I consider it to be an honor to be counted as your son, the highest honor, Father, that I could possibly have, is to know that Jesus, my elder brother, shed his blood in my behalf. And I pray, O oh Father, that his sacrifice will not be in vain for me. I pray for each and every one of us present here, Lord, and for those who may listen later to this recording. I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be poured out upon me in a mighty way, and that the words I speak, Lord, I will be do so only as a conduit, as an instrument of clay, but that the living Word who dwelleth in me will share your passion for the printed page with your followers, with your people, with your disciples. Help me, O oh Father, to lift this ministry up in its proper perspective this afternoon. And may we each one realize what a great debt we owe to the printed word, which now we can experience, Lord, in freedom here in this country, but in the future it may become condemned and we may have to keep it hidden in our hearts as the Waldensians did, daring to share it, Lord, at the expense of our lives. Bless us to this end, O Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message is called The Printed Prophets, and I've taken that from a book that I recently uh, have been studying and reading. Elder Jimenez, some of you may have known him or have heard him speak before, He's a great publishing leader in South America, 
And I think we can be very grateful that the Lord laid on his heart to compile a book emphasizing the importance of the printed page. It's been something that, as a literature evangelist for most of my life, has become a part of me. And I'd like to start by sharing with you a story, though. This is a story that happened many years ago, possibly even as much as 200 years ago, somewhere in that setting, over in southern England, in Europe. There were farmers settling out on pieces of land, and they would usually be very remote locations. They would have to build a house, dig a well, plant their gardens in soil that had not yet been cultivated. And this one far, farmer, an early settler in southern England, dug a well. And wells, oftentimes when they are dug, come up dry. So when a farmer found struck good water, it didn't take long for news to spread around the countryside. Sometimes people would come for miles to get water and to seek maybe some guidance and wisdom in digging their own well. But this particular farmer, as people came and began getting water from him, there was reports of miracles happening. People were being healed simply by bathing or drinking from this well. Well, it didn't take long for popularity to spread, and eventually this farmer had to build a little hotel, a little store to accommodate the visitors that become, began coming so frequently. Eventually, a little city grew up, a little town. And today, it's a thriving metropolis, a large city. A few years ago, a reporter from here in the States heard this story. And he checked as well as he could, and it seemed to be credible that there was some truth to this, this story. So he went and traveled over to England, to this city, and he began asking people that he met in his traveling, and after he got there, about this story that he had heard, about this well that contained water that had medicinal value. And people had heard the story. Many people confirmed that the story was true. But as try as he might, he could not seem to locate where the well original well had been dug. So finally he went to the town hall, to the city, to talk with the clerk there and ask her if she could give him some possible directions and confirmation of who he could speak with about this well. And the clerk confirmed the story too, that this city had grown up because of the discovery of this water that had medicinal qualities. And so he anxiously wanted to find out where the well was located and with some embarrassment the woman, the clerk she said, I'm sorry but it seems like we have not been able to locate the well. We have lost the source of our beginnings. And when I heard that story the first time I thought about we, as a remnant people. We didn't begin by accident. And we were given divine instruction when we began, when this movement started. But could it be that the Adventist church has lost the source of its beginnings or has forgotten you see, it was back in the mid-1800s, shortly after the Great Disappointment, when a body of believers continued to study the Scriptures, not believing that what they had understood could be completely in error. They wanted to get an understanding of why Jesus hadn't come back in 1844. And as they studied, there was a young woman who began 
receiving special instruction through divine providence, through visions and dreams. And in a meeting held in Dorchester, Massachusetts, November 1848, she writes, I had been given view of the proclamation of the sealing message and of the duty of the brethren to publish the light that was shining upon our pathway. And I want to tie this together. I hope that you will be able to see this. If you've studied in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 9, you hear of an angel that had a writer's inkhorn and was commanded to go throughout the city, beginning with the house of God, and set a mark upon the forehead. There were other angels there giving a, given a uh, destroying weapons. But this angel, this special angel with the writer's inkhorn, was to seal the servants of God. And I think it's significant that the Bible uses the language and the description of a writer's inkhorn. Ellen White in vision was told that the sealing message must be put into print. After coming out of vision, in fact, she said to her husband, I have a message for you. You must begin to print a little paper and send it out to the people. Let it be small at first, but as the people read, they will send you means with which to print, and it will be a success from the first. From this small beginning, it was shown to me to be like streams of light that went clear around the world. So we have a church beginning in 1849 where James White printed the first paper called Present Truth, printed in July in Middletown, Connecticut. By 1850, the first issue of the Second Advent Review and Sabbath Herald was printed in Paris, Maine. In 1860, the name of Seventh-day Adventist was first adopted. Not officially yet, not legally, but it was first adopted in 1860. And in 1863, at the first general conference, was when the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was legally done. May 21st, 1863. So we began, before we even had a church, with a special sealing message and the instruction to print. That is the source of our beginnings. The printed word. James would sit for hours in a wooden splint-bottomed chair while writing his editorials. It was eight miles from the Belton's home in Rocky Hill to Middletown, Connecticut, and James would often walk this distance of a 16 miles round trip as he made plans with the printer to publish their first edition of Present Truth. On the day he was to pick up the papers from the printer, he borrowed Brother Belton's horse and buggy. When the papers, 1,000 copies of Present Truth, came from the press, they were folded on a table in a room in Colonel Chamberlain's house. Then they put them on the floor and bowed in a circle around those papers before God in prayer, asking his blessing, his special blessing upon them. James continued to print the next three issues of Present Truth from Middletown, Connecticut. And as he and Ellen must often travel and speak, the Present Truth's next issues, issues, six, issues five through ten, were printed and distributed from Oswego, New York from December 1849 to May 1950. From Oswego, they went to Center Point, Point with brother and sister Edson. They moved into a home of Brother Harris where they published a monthly magazine called the Advent Review. During the summer of 1850, later in November, the first issue of the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald was issued from Paris, Maine. During these early days, the Whites were vehemently attacked by satanic forces. Their little child Edson became extremely sick. Ellen was attacked through her spirit and mind and began even doubting her acceptance with God. And experiencing a crushing of her spirit, James had a terrible sickness of cholera come upon him. Ellen writes about one account where Edson was attacked. She says, That night we were awakened by the screams of our little Edson, who slept in the room above us. 
It was about midnight. Our little boy would cling to Sister Bonfoy, then with both hands fighting the air. In terror, he would cry, No, 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 and cling closer to us. We knew this was Satan's effort to annoy us, and we knelt in prayer. My husband rebuked the evil spirit in the name of the Lord, and Edson quietly fell asleep in Sister Bonfoy's arms and rested well through the night. The Review and Herald. In November 1850, the paper was issued at Paris, Maine. Here it was enlarged and its name changed to what it now bears until recent years, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. We boarded in Brother A's family. We were willing to live cheaply that the paper might be sustained. The friends of the cause were few in number and poor in worldly wealth. And we were still compelled to struggle with poverty and great discouragement. We had much care and often sat up as late as midnight and sometimes until two or three in the morning to read proof sheets. Excessive labor, care, and anxiety, a lack of proper and nourishing food, and exposure to cold in our long winter journeys were too much for my husband, and he sank under the burden. He became so weak that he could scarcely walk to the printing office. Our faith was tried to the utmost. We had willingly endured privation, toil, and suffering, yet our motives were misinterpreted, and we were regarded with distrust and jealousy. Few of those whose good we seem we had suffered seemed to appreciate our efforts. We were too much troubled to sleep or rest. The hours in which we should have been refreshed with sleep were often spent in answering long communications occasioned by envy. Many hours while others were sleeping we spent in agonizing tears and mourning before the Lord. At length my husband said, Wife, it is of no use to try to struggle on any longer. These things are crushing me and will soon carry me to the grave. I cannot go farther. I have written a note for the paper stating that I shall publish no more. As he stepped out of the door to carry the note to the printing office, I fainted, and he came back and prayed for me. His prayer was answered, and I was relieved. The next morning, while at family prayer, I was taken off in vision and was instructed concerning these matters. I saw that my husband must not give up the paper, for Satan was trying to drive him to take just such a step and was working through agents to do this. I was shown that we must continue to publish, and the Lord would sustain us. We soon received urgent invitations to hold conferences in different states, and decided to attend gathering, general gatherings at Boston, Massachusetts, Rocky Hill, Connecticut, Camden, and West Milton, New York. These were all meetings of labor, but very profitable to our scattered brethren. James White gave the following reasons why he felt the paper should no longer be printed at the commercial printing office in Saratoga Springs in New York. He said it is not convenient to print such a paper at a suitable printing office and have the work put by on the seventh day. And it is very unpleasant to us, as well as inconvenient, to have the work done on the Sabbath. If a small office was owned by the brethren, the paper could be printed in such an office for about three-fourths of what others can afford to do it for in a larger printing establishment. We think that the hands can be obtained who are keeping the Sabbath, who would take an interest in the paper that cannot be expected of others. In this case, much care would be taken from the one that had charge of it. In April 1852, still more than two years before our church was organized, we moved to Rochester, New York, under the most discouraging circumstances. At every step, we were obliged to advance by faith. We were still crippled by poverty and compelled to exercise the most rigid economy and self-denial. I will give a brief extract from a letter in Brother Howland's family dated April 16, 1852. We are just getting settled. This is quoting now from Ellen White's letter. We are just getting settled now in Rochester. We have rented an old house for $175 a year. We have the press. A Washington hand press was bought for $652.93. This was the first publishing enterprise owned and operated by the Sabbath keepers in the house. It was in one of the rooms in the house. Were it not for this, we would have to pay $50 a year for office room. You would smile 
could you look in upon us and see our furniture. We have bought two old bedsteads for 25 cents each. My husband brought me home six old chairs, no two of them alike, for which he paid one dollar. And soon he presented me with four more old chairs without any seating, for which he paid 62 cents. The frames are strong and I have been sit sitting, seating them with drilling. And I've highlighted this next sentence in my notes. She says, butter is so high that we do not purchase it. Neither can we afford potatoes. We use sauce in the place of butter and turnips for potatoes. Our first meals were taken on a fireboard placed upon two empty flour barrels. We are willing to endure privation if the work of God can be advanced. We believe the Lord's hand was in our coming to this place. There is a large field for labor and but few laborers. Last Sabbath, our meeting was excellent. The Lord refreshed us with his presence. I believe, brothers and sisters, we can learn from this example of our early pioneers. She says, We toiled on in Rochester through much perplexity and discouragement. The cholera visited the city, and while it raged all night long, the carriages bearing the dead were heard rumbling through the streets to Mount Hope Cemetery. Pressing on in New England, we had appointments out for two months, reaching from Rochester, New York, to Bangor, Maine. And this journey we were to perform with our covered carriage and our good horse, Charlie, given to us by brethren in Vermont. We had before us a journey of about 100 miles to perform in two days, yet we believed that the Lord would work with us, work for us. Little Edson White, afflicted with cholera and healed in answer to prayer, accompanied his parents on the trip. At first it seemed that the child would die from the rigors of the journey. But his strength returned and his mother wrote, We brought him home quite rugged. What a contrast, my friends, from the source of our beginnings to where we are today. In spite of decisions that have been made here in the North American Division to close two of our denominational publishing houses, we still have a total of 63 publishing houses throughout the world. Truly the vision is being fulfilled from this small beginning. And as the three angels' message circles the globe like streams of light going clear around the world, we rejoice knowing that we have not followed cunningly devised fables. But while God is ever seeking to expand the reach of his present truth message, it often appears that his church doesn't always keep in step with divine providence. In 1992, we had approximately 1,200 full-time literature evangelists in North America, plus hundreds of part-time adult co-porters. However, there were certain leaders in the North American division at that time that decided that the publishing should exist without any financial support from the tithe dollar. And they began looking ways to cut corners. Therefore, the decision was made to close all nine of the HHS facilities, Home Health Education Service, which provides an effective payroll and distribution center for literature evangelists who are trying to make a living. And try as an experiment instead one location based in Southern California. After nearly four years of this experiment, which started with almost $2 million in the bank, by the way, it was $4 million in the red, financially. And nearly all of the adult literature evangelists were gone. And the program had to be shut down by the North American Division. Fortunately, we can praise God, here in the Southern Union, there were leaders who had refused to close our publishing program or close our HHES. And although the system wasn't perfect, we were still functioning and providing support for our full-time co-porters. Recently, just less than two years ago now, we have restructured our HHES, and currently we are operating in the most financially strong position that the HHS has had since I came here in 1991. 
We're in the process of developing new books and new products that are more competitively priced. And currently, we are experiencing an increased interest from numerous individuals across the continent who are looking for a way to work as full-time literature evangelists. Some of these are in conferences where there is no publishing program whatsoever here in North America. Brothers and sisters, the role of the literature in the last days is important. To make it very simple for you, I have a little paper that I recently printed and gave to some of the church members down in Murfreesboro about the ABCs of the latter rain and the loud cry. The latter rain will not be poured out, and I'll come to this in my notes in a little bit here, but the latter rain will not be poured out on an indolent people. It will not be poured out while the great majority of Christ's remnant people are inactive. And it's very simple. Revelation 18.1 The fourth angel who comes down with great power and lightens the earth with his glory, we are instructed that in a large degree is the literature ministry. It is our publishing ministry that enlightens the earth with God's glory. We are living in solemn and awe-stilling times. The second coming of Jesus is at the very door, and signs of his approach are increasingly evident. Without a doubt, we are on the cusp of events that will overwhelm the whole world. In the immediate future, and yet we must bear in mind that the Lord will appear only after the gospel message has been given as a witness to the whole world. As such, we must awaken to the seriousness of the mission he has entrusted to us. We have special truths that have not yet been communicated to the vast majority of earth's teeming multitudes. Mark Finley rightly reminds us that among our efforts toward revival, we must continually renew our commitment to save the lost. Quoting from his book called Revive Us Again, page 124, he says, Why would God pour out his spirit in the latter rain power to finish his work if the majority of the church has little or no interest in witnessing? If the latter rain, the fullness of the Holy Spirit's power, is to empower the church to reach the world with God's end-time message, why would God give us the latter rain if we have a complacent, lukewarm attitude toward reaching the people? The fullness of the Holy Spirit's power will be poured out on a praying, totally committed, unified, witnessing church. End of quote. And a quote I gave you a moment ago is from Christian Service, page 149, where she says, in a large degree through our publishing houses is to be accomplished the work of that other angel who comes down from heaven with great power and who lightens the earth with his glory. Let me give you the perspective of a couple other denominations. The Assemblies of God, a leader by the name of Bob Hoskins, recently wrote, Christian literature anointed by the Holy Spirit is always effective and the only way, I believe, that we will be able to fulfill Christ's injunction to reach all the world. This man's most recent goal was to distribute 92.5 million books. Using a well-defined plan, his group has so far distributed more than 800 million books. A copy of a book called The Book of Hope in various countries around the world. From another source... It's Every Home for Christ program, a systematic distribution of evangelical literature to reach every home in various countries in cooperation with local churches and missionaries has so far circulated three and a quarter billion pieces of literature. Dick Eastman, one of the program leaders, states on the front of his book, a global movement is underway to reach every home for Christ. The impact will be beyond imagination. End of quote. Clearly such leaders see publishing playing a decisive role in the completion of the preaching of the gospel, yet they were far from the first to reach this conclusion. Martin Luther once said that the press is God's highest and extremest act of grace, whereby the business of the gospel is driven forward. Well, what about radio, television, and the internet? Aren't we currently witnessing the transformation of print meeting, print media into an electronic electronic form? There were some people who thought so. But even over the last 10 years of carefully studying the market, electronic format of books has maxed out at 21% and hovers somewhere around 16 to 18% of the market. And even among that, 50% of the people who buy the electric format of an e-book 
also buy a hardcover book too to go along with it. We can be forgiven for falling prey to the claim that literature just doesn't have the pull it had in the past ages and that although important, it surely doesn't come in third, fourth, or even fifth place in use of prom and prominence. Or is there something about the printed page that we have not yet realized? You may be surprised to learn that in the context of the last great crisis, print media will be one of the most crucial means that the Lord will employ to save millions from the deadly delusions looming in the future. Why I call this message the printed prophets. Look, let's look more closely into how the printed prophets are perfectly adapted to our time and why they will have such relevance in the rapid diffusion of the gospel at the very end. Ellen White observes that in Coporter Ministry, page 6, it is as good and successful a method as can be employed for placing before the people the important truths for this time. Also, she says on page 3, the book work should be the means of quickly giving the sacred light of present truth to the world. Publications are God's key instrument. God has always used print, both symbolically and literally. The Ten Commandments were written upon tables of stone. You are better, you are a letter of Christ, we read in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. We know that God wants to do something big in our time, and that publications will constitute one of the key, His key instruments. Thus, our church must focus its efforts to use this means as never before. For example, on a Sabbath, March 24, 2012, in a church in South America, they distributed 25 million copies of The Great Hope, a condensed version of The Great Controversy. They did that in one day. From the book Education, Earth's final days are now. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes, have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. And on page 179, paragraph 6, she says, But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth, and when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. Brothers and sisters, I believe we are currently in what I would call the eye of the storm. Our church was persecuted in ages past, and we have had a time, a long period of time now, of apparent peace and prosperity, especially we've experienced here in the United States of America. But when you're in the eye of the storm, often the worst is yet to come. When those winds of strife are released, we will experience a time of Jacob's trouble, such as the world has never witnessed. She wrote this more than a century ago, how much closer are we to seeing its predicted fulfillment? Much closer than many of us care to imagine. Partly out of self-awareness that it will be a time of intense difficulty for the church. The dragon will make one last effort to destroy God's people. Revelation 12, 17. How will the church face such unpleasant odds? Make headway with the truths that so many will regard at the height, as the height of heresy. And who would voluntarily champion such a controversial cause. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 463, says the work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity she will have to do in a terrible crisis under the most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. The warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. The laws of Christ's kingdom are so simple so compact and yet so complete that any man-made additions will create confusion. And the more simple our plans for God work in God's service, the more we shall accomplish.
by studying how they can adopt the plans of worldly policy in their work for God, men disarrange God's plans of humility and simplicity, which he desires shall be followed in advancing his kingdom. Don't mistake what I'm saying. I think we should use radio and TV and internet as long as we can. But there will be coming a time in the near future when those avenues will be shut down and will be forbidden. I'll give you one such example here uh, in a moment. How can the great work of the third angel's message be accomplished? In welfare ministry, page 97, she says, it must be largely accomplished by persevering individual effort, by visiting the people in their homes. Again, in manuscript 26, 1905, paragraph 9, she said, one of the simplest yet most effective methods of labor is that of the canvasser evangelist. In Great Controversy, page 612, she says, Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warnings will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. And signs and wonders will follow the believers. Brothers and sisters, it's going to take human contact. One-on-one. -on -one. It's very clear when you read the blueprint that has been given to us from our Commander-in-Chief. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence, yet many whose minds were impressed have not been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere, Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. I will tell you something that I have observed in the 35, 40 years. My father started this work when I was six years old, so I've grown up in it. I've observed the publishing work for 50 years. I can tell you that religious freedom would not be what it is here in the not United States of America today if it had not been for a book called The Great Controversy. That book has been, being bed, has been read and reread by many, if not most, of the politicians here in the United States. How many of you have seen the MAGA book with the flag on the front and the Statue of Liberty? Any of you have seen that? I actually was given that concept by the Lord about 15 or 20 years ago. I was the one that came up with that idea. Pacific Press told me repeatedly, they have distributed more great controversies since that patriotic cover came out than they ever did before. I know that the first George Bush president has the whole conflict of the ages series in his home. I've seen it with him in the wall above his bed where him and Barbara were sitting with the grandkids, all ten of Arthur Maxwell Bible stories, and all six, including Bible readings for the home, of the conflict of the ages. When we did the patriotic cover on the MAGA book, I asked Pacific Press to send a box of them to George Bush because at that time, 9-11 had just happened. And we had a quote from George Bush on the back of the book. Glenn Beck, who is a good Christian Mormon, following, I believe, the light as he understands it at this point in his life, has been given at least 100 great controversies, he said, in the last five years. He has personally had meetings with Dwight Hall of Remnant Publications three times. Brothers and sisters, the great controversy is a powerful book that God has used to maintain religious freedom. The final responsibility for the preaching of the gospel, both now and in the future, lies fully with the members of the church. First and foremost, the missionary strength of the church rests within every single member independent of place or position. This will especially be true in the final struggle. Second, I want to emphasize that God will call into action agencies currently known only to Him to aid in completing the vast task. In Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 118, it says, When divine power is combined with human effort, the work will spread like fire and stubble. God will employ agencies whose origin man will be unable to discern. Angels will do a work which men might have had the blessing of accomplishing 
had they not neglected to answer the claims of God. Broadcast media, despite their present glory, will not have the accessibility in the coming struggle that a simple book has and always will have. For now, it is possible to define more thoroughly the word forbidding that Ellen White used in the previous quote. In the wealth of the messages we have from her concerning the final struggle, it is not difficult to conclude that our broadcast media outlets will one day be censored or entirely banned by governments around the world. This quote comes from an article online. It's a place called articlewaves.com. Reasons for media censorship. Sometimes it is important to control the flow of information, some experts say, particularly where the situation pertains to religious problems and information wrongly distributed in a tense situation which can cause explosive results. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, she writes in Great Controversy, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. All this will produce perplexities that are scarcely dreamed of, she says. Mass media will falter because they have always been, and again I'm quoting from an online source, a man named Herbert Forrestell. His topic was called Banned in the Media. He goes, mass media will falter because they have always been the captive of religion and politics, scorned and manipulated by both in ways beyond anything suffered by book publishers. Vicente Lanero, in his prologue to a Jesuit publication called Freedom of Expression in Church, page 11, he wrote, The Vatican, drunk with power, desperate for control over its faithful, intends to shackle us to her, her flock and forbid us to even think. Civil power. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman effort to shut away the light lest it should shine upon the flocks, their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. Recently, the Assembly of God missionaries had to retreat to the written word when the government of an Islamic country in which they were preaching suddenly revoked their permit to the television program. Bob Hoskins, an Assemblies of God leader, explains that the public response to his program made the government nervous, and that was enough for them to ban it. But we can be encouraged, you and I, because we have the spirit of prophecy in our midst. And we who are avid readers of our Bibles and of the letters and instruction given through Ellen White already know the end of the story. She says, as long as probation lasts, as long as probation continues, there will be opportunity for the canvassing work. When the religious denominations unite with the papacy to oppress God's people, places where there is religious freedom will be opened. By radio? No. By television? No. By internet? No. By evangelistic canvassing. God is planning on using the printed page until the very last day when probation closes. Preempting the crisis is important. And I, well, that's why I made the statement about the great controversy. I believe the great controversy has done a large work in preempting and postponing this crisis. You know, we have a paradox. We've been instructed to work to hasten the coming of Jesus and to pray for probation to linger as long as possible so that as many can be saved. It's not really diametrically opposed because we need to hasten the coming of Christ because I don't know what day will be my last. I don't know what day will be my neighbor's last. If we are serious about counteracting the effect of falsehood in the final struggle, we must meet it by preempting it. Waiting until the crisis hits to proclaim the message would greatly diminish its potential redemptive act, impact. And that is exactly what Satan has been trying to do for at least the last 20 or 30 years. A great and mighty oak exists because of a root system. And most trees, not all, but most trees have what we call a tap root. And publishing ministry is the tap root of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And Lucifer is trying to sever that tap root. And he was nearly successful in doing it, unfortunately, here in North America. 
But I believe God is calling the attention back to the literature ministry. I believe that there are those here who God is calling to this work, either full-time or at least on a regular, systematic basis. No man can struggle with advantages against the spirit of his age and country, and however powerful he may be supposed to be, he will find it difficult to make his contemporaries share in feelings and opinions which are repugnant to all their feelings and desires. It comes from a book called Democracy in America. How much of the world would we be able to reach should we wait till the last possible moment before we act? Hasn't God entrusted his message early precisely to counteract the human tendency to procrastination? As faithful watchmen, you should see the sword coming and give the warning that men and women may not pursue a course through ignorance that they would avoid if they knew the truth. That sums up why I have spent most of my life working as a literature evangelist. I asked myself the question one day when I was very young, Jarrell, and kind of discouraged and scared to knock on the next door, trying to find up a courage, you know, drive around the neighborhood to see if it looks safe. And it wouldn't look safe enough, so I'd go to another neighborhood and drive around that trying to get the courage. And the Lord impressed me and said, Rocky, if you were in that house, living in that home, and you didn't know what you know, wouldn't you want someone to knock on your door? Even if it was an inconvenience? And tell you? And I said, absolutely, Lord. There are people, believe it or not, and you won't hear this from very many pulpits in the Adventist church, but believe it or not, there are people who will be lost unless we as God's instruments of righteousness knock on their door. Or give them a piece of literature at the checkout register. Or at the gas station. Or at the bus station. We have been called. We are a peculiar people. One tract containing present truth, we cannot tell what may be accomplished. Thousands in the eleventh hour will see and acknowledge the truth. These conversions to truth will be made at a rapidity that will surprise the church. A good many do not see it now to take their position, but these things are influencing their lives, and when the message goes with a loud voice, they will be ready for it. Every truly honest soul will come to the light of the truth. Last day events, page 213. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Hans LaRondel who passed away a few years ago, one of our Adventist pioneers, said, It is the final contest between the combined forces of Satan on the one hand and Christ with his chosen faithful followers on the other, in referring to the battle of Armageddon. We are told that it is a battle for the mind. I'd like to take to the end of my message here Lots of other things I wanted to bring out. But there's a good illustration of what the publishing work is doing in this world and in the lives of people. There's so many examples in the Bible of God using the written word, using the book, in Japan, how many of you here are into agriculture? I'm sure there's some. We can take a lesson from the Japanese bamboo farmers. They prepare the soil by fertilizer and irrigating, making certain the ground is ready after ridding the area of pests and rocks and weeds. They weed and fertilize it and air irrigate it some more. Then they can place the plant in the seed bed. However, after many weeks, little evidence is seen that the plants have any intention of germinating. Six months, nine months go by without any change, no apparent growth. Yet, the farmers must keep working day after day, week after week, fertilizing and watering. They would make a big mistake if they slacked off once the process was underway. In truth, they must demonstrate great patience 
to see the results of their labor. Six years go by, apparently nothing happening. But in the seventh year, there appears in the seedbed a shoot of what will become an extraordinary plant. Once again, once that happens, things really take off. In surprising fashion, bamboo, like asparagus, develops in a way that can almost, uh, where you can almost see it grow by the hour. Some plants reach 100 feet in height in only 12 to 15 weeks. The long wait and diligent effort receive more than ample reward. So what's the moral of the story? Just this. When typhoons beat mercilessly, merciless, mercilessly on Japanese coasts and drag everything away, especially tree roots and plants of all kinds, one plant remains immovable. It may bend beneath the hurricane winds, but no matter how hard the wind may blow, it simply will not uproot bamboo. It grows out of sight before any visible development so that, when, that, so that no storm can lay it waste. And brothers and sisters, that's exactly what the publishing ministry has done. It has built an incredible root system all over the world. In fact, they estimate that the underground church in China, Adventist church, is unnumberable. The corollary is that we cannot expect the books, tracts, and magazines that we distribute to bear fruit immediately. And as I said in the beginning, I believe we should actively and earnestly seek to harvest, even while we're sowing seed. But the great harvest is going to come at the end when we see more than 1,000 converted in one day most of who will trace their convictions to the reading of our publications. And I don't believe that's a thousand people worldwide. I believe we're going to see a thousand in Nashville. I believe we're going to see a thousand in Memphis day after day come to accept and embrace the Sabbath truths. Today, the printed page is growing at an impressive root system. And every single one of us should be su supremely interested in seeing that these roots are sufficiently robust to withstand the struggles of the coming crisis. Our work is simply to disseminate our message abundantly. And I would like to add, also, hide it in our own hearts. Because it's that same printed word growing in our hearts and our minds that will make us immovable in the time of the storm too. The explosive spreading of the gospel is a single, the single greatest need, sign of Jesus' soon coming. Everything about us may look like business as usual, yet Christ is at the door. But how will the ripening happen? Ellen White explains, these silent messengers are enlightening and molding the minds of thousands in every country and in every clime. And she adds, more than 1,000 will soon be converted in one day, most of who will trace their first convictions to the reading of our publications. May God make all of us literature evangelists in my prayer. Shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubim.